Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. President, colleagues, dear friends, uh, we are so grateful for this evening. Uh, and we'll remember this long after uh, the fest shift is behind us. But of course, we'll have that wonderful collection of essays to remind us of this special day. Uh, my life in public relations began as a consultant, but soon after that I started teaching in the College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. I appreciate the chance that you've given me to reflect on those years in academia. And I hope that as I ramble on this afternoon, you will find yourselves reflecting on your own storied lives, because I believe any one of us could be here. Oh, thank you, I was tempted to do that. Um, and I expect that in some ways our narratives are very similar. Um, in your life, have you not had times of disenchantment, but then times of renewal? Um, relationships that were both constructive and disabling? Um, institutions we worked with that were both inhospitable and sometimes welcoming. And the overarching context for our stories, of course, is one of the power of the institutions that enable us. Mine, like yours, I imagine, is a story of infinite complexity because it involves other people's lives as well as our own. Of course, our families, but also the students, the fellow teachers and researchers around the world, and the administrators at home. And I'll have more to say about administrators in a few moments. Um, it's a dark tale in some senses because of the repression of public relations that exists in too many faculties. Public relations faculties face particular dilemmas in journalism schools, at least in the United States. The enduring question is how we fit under the majority rule there, because there are usually just a couple of us and lots of them. Uh, and this dilemma can become a form of what I consider intellectual molestation. But Jim and I chose to adapt. We ultimately left journalism and we reestablished our program in Maryland's Department of Communication. But to this day, I remain haunted by experiences in the early years of my academic career. And make no mistakes, these uh, issues have not been resolved for others who continue to teach in public relations, although I understand that new research is showing that the situation is getting better. So anyhow, you can imagine my joy at being retired now, unencumbered by classroom responsibilities. I'm very happy, but I'm almost shocked to say so. I never dreamed that retirement could be this good. Uh, but what happened between the early years as an assistant professor in journalism and my current status as a professor emerita, there was lots and lots of teaching, of advising, and research. But of course, we're here to talk about the research today. All through those years, I have tried to understand the world and the role that I play in it. And at the same time, I know as the Athenian comic dramatist Menander said, in many ways, the saying, know thyself, is lacking. Better to know other people. And that's what our discipline, public relations, is all about, understanding the concerns of the publics with whom organizations are interdependent. My hope is that through communication, we can promote a kind of globalism rather than any unilateralism wherein an organization or a country pursues only its own interests. A recent article by David Perlmutter in the Chronicle of Higher Education chronicle, uh, characterized research as an archipelago rather than a single island. I built my life in public relations piece by piece. Most pieces relate to each other, and yet they don't add up to a unified whole, a true gestalt, the one island that seems to be the goal of scholars in public relations. For example, as a PhD candidate in the early 1980s, I was interested in developing a general theory of public relations. Using both qualitative and quantitative methods, I was on a quest for unifying knowledge. Early on, I recognized that the emergence of a theory that is recognizable and real, rich and wide in its scope, could not be accomplished in short form. 
And thus the form of the inquiry became increasingly important to me in my life's work. I began to write about not only what I discovered, but how I found out. For example, when I was asking questions about employee communication, I determined that focus group research would empower people to speak up with the strength of others in their office, uh, often backing them up. And thus began a career-long interest in the appropriate and inappropriate uses of group interviews. I found focus groupings incredibly useful when, for example, I was interviewing the chronically mentally ill for a local department of mental health. And I wrote about my demonstration focus groups with this distinctive population. While doing international research with several other colleagues, I dissected what it was like to work on an intercultural team. Few people have written about the challenges and the opportunities of team research in public relations. And as I studied more and more about the ethics of public relations, I became concerned about the ethics of what we do as researchers. And as a result, I began to write about safeguarding the participants in our research, about dealing with all of the data, including the outliers, about transparency in the research process, about the imperity of accessibility to our data, and even about choosing our research topics responsibly. Together, these writings about research on research helped form a complementary archipelago to my more substantive questions about public relations effectiveness and ethics. Well, capturing the contradictions inherent in public relations practice and then integrating them into an organic whole, a general theory, has proved to be a lifelong challenge, and it's one that I have not accomplished to this day. But through the study of excellence in public relations and communication management, we got pretty close. Making my own saga a global one, of course, began with the Excellence Project in the late 1980s. That multi-year, I think Dayan said 10 years, and you weren't exaggerating, project funded by the International Association of Business Communicators helped determine what public relations contributes to organizational effectiveness. So as I moved my work uh, away from my own general theory and more toward the excellence propositions, my archipelago began to form in two major research streams, activism and women in public relations. And before any would-be geologists here tonight argue that archipelagos are only found in the sea, I must insist that they are groups of islands surrounded by any body of water, okay? Uh, though these may be two distinct bodies of inquiry, organizational response to activist pressure and gender issues, in my mind they were or are related. Activist pressure typically develops when the activist groups feel wronged or ignored by organizations. And similarly, the question of diversity in our field has become central as women and other groups outside the dominant norm of the ubiquitous white male begin to question and ultimately to challenge their treatment at the hands of the organization. These are all issues of power, and that has brought me to explore the use and abuse of power in organizations, most recently through theories of organizational justice and also the ethics inherent in dealing between groups with different levels of influence and resources. In spite of my own work over the last 30 plus years and that of colleagues all over the world, I have to acknowledge that the extent evidence shows only the surface. There beneath the streams of all our hard work lies the bedrock of the archipelago. We still need deep research. We need accessible writing of our results and we need judicious reflection. I may not want it to be so, but that's how it is. And it isn't only the end that matters. The getting there is important too. I've always valued the pleasure of discovery, the intellectual passion that appeals to my inner philosopher, or maybe it's my inner Sherlock Holmes. Um, anyhow, the continental fragments of my research archipelago may be small, but I've worked toward an understanding of public relations practice in ways that cumulatively may have made a difference, and I'm proud of that, if so. Uh, adopted children, like my daughter, Lara, and their adoptive parents, like Jim and me, know how terribly powerful the desire to know who you are is. 
One of my favorite pieces of research on research was published in one of the Bledcom books. I wrote a chapter about public relations as the thinking heart of the organization. I argued that public relations people at their most effective use both their head and their hearts when they legitimate the concerns of their publics, both external and internal. And public relations professionals maintain their credibility with the organization when they use their analytical abilities to think through their plans. They do this through formative research. And they also measure whether they've been effective by doing evaluative research. I do believe the desire to know what it is to be effective and ethical as a practitioner of public relations is a powerful driving force. Who are we? I stayed the course through a hectic professional life and personal life, um, four children in our blended family, uh, through isolation as a scholar of public relations in a school of media types with its attendant climate of disrespect that at a time, uh, from time to time, reached actual levels of academic bullying and a lack of adequate support for the projects I deemed important. But at the same time, in discovering who we are as public relations people, I enjoyed the challenge of doing something I liked, complex though it was, research that would hopefully make the world a better place. I had the opportunity to engage with colleagues who were supportive and interested in my work, even when their criticisms seemed at times to be a bit demoralizing and, well, of course, sadly uninformed. Uh, but I got to begin anew every semester, even though many of the relationships I made with students have lasted across time and space. Thank you, God, for conferences. And we all understand that the zealous students are terrific, and they more than make up for the administrators. And now, looking back, I realize that no matter how much we grow up, we keep right on growing up and going on to other things, bumps and all. So we don't have a global unifying theory of public relations, one solid island in a sea of uncertainty that explains what we need to do to make our organizations more effective, more ethical, and more inclusive, a theory accepted by our colleagues in rhetoric, in cultural and critical studies, in mass media, and in integrated marketing communication. We don't even agree on the most effective and ethical approaches to doing the research that might lead us to such a theory. So we don't have all the answers yet. This may be my final lecture, as the BLEDCOM program calls it, but it certainly does not mark the completion of my archipelago of research. As Thornton Wilder, who was an American playwright who also taught at the University of Chicago, put it, where there is an unknowable, there is promise. Thank you. Uh, the title of this lecture has been billed as, uh, this lecture has been billed as our last lecture in public relations. Now there's a wonderful Spanish phrase, ojalá, which means, oh, that it were true. <laughs> and so I think this is, is really wishful thinking by a lot of critical public relations scholars. But, and I think uh, our friend Elizabeth Ananto from the, uh, Indonesia would be disappointed because we've agreed to go to Bali for a conference in October. So unless uh, either one of us die immediately after this lecture, it's probably not our last one. Um, but the title, My Life in Public Relations, and as practitioners would say, have you ever done this? And to some extent the answer, well, is no. Actually, I've, well, I have practiced public relations, and I'll say a few words about that, but most of my life has been spent thinking about public relations more so than doing public relations. And this, I think, is quite important because I'm afraid too many uh, people who do public relations seldom think about what they're doing or why they're doing it. But the concept of thinking about public relations takes me to the concept of intellectual history. And in revising the history chapter of my textbook several years ago, in a chapter that never was published, uh, I discovered intellectual history or the history of ideas. And it seemed to me very interesting, instead of looking at the history of public relations as the history of famous men and women, uh, mostly men, but occasionally a woman, 
uh, that intellectual history or the, the origin of different ideas in public relations was very interesting. So that's what I would like to talk a, a, a bit about this afternoon, which is uh, where did some of the ideas that I've had come from? And actually there haven't been very many big ideas, maybe three or four. Uh, and, uh, and if I try to determine where they came from, uh, it's easier to look back than it is to look forward. Now, uh, Soren Kierkegaard had said, has said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Now, Jung Nam Kim, my former student, has this phrase at the bottom of his email, and he has rephrased it to say, life is lived forward, but understood backward, and which uh, did clarify what Kierkegaard had in mind. Uh, so I'm trying to look backward briefly. Uh, Karl Popper, the philosopher of science, uh, has also written a book of essays called All Life is Problem Solving. Uh, uh, Popper was writing about the philosophy of science, but he also applied the idea of problem solving to life in general. And let me quote briefly from Popper. He said, the natural as well as the social sciences always start from problems from the fact that something inspires amazement in us, as the Greek philosophers used to say. To solve these problems, the scientists use fundamentally the same message that common sense employs, the method of trial and error. To be more precise, it is a method of trying out solutions to our problems and then discarding the false ones is erroneous. At bottom, this procedure seems to be the only logical one. It is also the procedure that a lower organism even a single cell amoeba uses when trying to solve a problem. In this case, we speak of testing movements through which an organism tries to rid itself of a troublesome problem. Higher organisms are able to learn through trial and error how a, serious pro a certain problem should be solved. We may say that they, they too make testing movements, mental testings, and that to learn is essentially to try out one testing move and movement after another until one is found that solves the problem. Now, in my graduate education in the 1960s, I took a course in John Dewey at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, John Dewey also emphasized the concept of problem solving. In four books, uh, How We Think, written in 1910, Human Nature and Conduct, written in 1922, uh, The Public and Its Problems in 1927, and logic, the theory of inquiry in 1938, Dewey maintained that both human problems, human thought and inquiry, which we would call information seeking today, begin when a person experiences an indeterminate situation, which he described as a felt difficulty. When a person recognizes and defines an indeterminate situation, it becomes a problematic situation. So in short, both my life history and my intellectual history are histories of problem solving, of recognizing indeterminate situations, thinking about them until they become problematic situations, seeking or perhaps just processing advice from others, reading, conducting research, and constructing solutions to problems, in other words, theory. Well, I'd like to take you back, given that nature of problem solving, to some of my early life problems when I was in my 20s and how that evolved in some, into some of the theories that I used. <clears throat> well, my f life thinking about public relations, uh, Dan Verchich said 1960, and that was pretty close. That was the year I graduated from high school. And I, all of my, no one but my older brother had ever gone to a university before but we all went to an agricultural college, Iowa State University. So the problem was, in my mind, what, do I, what should I study when I go to Iowa State University? I had no idea. I was too short to be an NBA basketball player, <laughs> which was my ultimate goal. But my mother read, in the first piece of advice on my career, my mother read an article about an agricultural journalist in a farm equipment magazine uh, published by the Oliver Tractor Company. And she said, this is what you should do. And so I did. I went to Iowa State University to study agricultural journalism. 
So then the next problem became, what should I do after I graduated from Iowa State University? And my advisor, a man named Carl Hamilton, said, why don't you go to graduate school? Well, keeping in my mind that uh, my father hadn't gone to high school, graduate school was something out of the question. But uh, again, I listened to advice, and I went to the University of, of, of Wisconsin, and still wanting to be an agricultural journalist, I studied agricultural economics so that I would have something to write about. I was <laughs> still a technician in those days. So while I was in my master's degree, I had no idea that I would do a PhD, but I wanted to take, in addition to economics courses, uh, some courses in, in journalism. So one of the people I consulted, a man named uh, Richard Powers, in the Wisconsin's Agricultural Journalism Department, uh, I asked him if he thought I should take a course in advanced editing. And he said, no, I think you should study social psychology. <laughs> and I said, first, why? Uh, but I began to understand why very shortly. And that's a point where I began thinking about the role of theory and the importance of theory in, in public relations and related fields. Um, now, <clears throat> okay, um, the next, well, at that point I had no idea that I would do a PhD, that I would ever become a theorist, that I would be speaking to you in Bled at this time. Uh, and I went to work to uh, working on an internal publication for the International Harvester Company, another farm equipment manufacturer in Chicago. And I was ready to begin my life in public relations. I was getting married, I was finishing graduate school, and then one of the biggest problems occurred. Uh, the problem was being drafted to serve in the war in Vietnam, which, to use Popper's words, inspired amazement in me. Um, I didn't want to do it, and I didn't, uh, and I objected to the war. So, what was the solution to the problem? Well, I enrolled in a PhD program, and so <laughs> here I am today. Um, so, it was in that PhD program that my intellectual history actually began. And the problem at that time was writing a term paper for, in a course taught by <coughs> Bruce Wesley, who was a well-known communica mass communication theorist at the time. It was one of the, the originators of the wesley mclean model, which you've probably seen. And Bruce's assignment was write a paper about some theory of your choice. Well, most people were writing about cognitive dissonance or the effects of mass media or so on. But I had taken all these courses in economics, so my, it had occurred to me that there really is no such thing as perfect knowledge, as the economists of the time believed, so that I should study the role of information in economic decision making. And this came back this afternoon when we had a session on the need to study economics in, in public relations. Well, I wrote a term paper that was published called The Role of Information in Economic Decision Making. It was about uh, economic decision making and problem solving. It used Don Dewey to a large extent. And that became, I think, the first big idea, which is today I still call the situational theory of publics, or as Jung Nam Kim has rephrased it, the situational theory of problem solving. And he's taking this, taken this much uh, further than I ever have. Uh, the major intellectual problem at the time in communication was defined by dissonance theory. And the question was, uh, why do people seek information? Um, I was greatly influenced by Richard Carter, some, someone most of you have not heard of, but was at that time at the University of Wisconsin and then went on to uh, many years at the University of Washington. And we spent a seminar talking about the shortcomings of, dis of dissonance theory. And this is where the, the entire idea of that public relation or communication is problem solving and people so seek information when it is relevant to problems that they are facing became very clear to me. Now the other great influence on my life in graduate school was both from Carter and uh, Steve Chafee and Jack McLeod's concept of co-orientation. Uh, the idea that people co-orient to each other and not that one person tries to orient someone else to himself or herself through attitude change or something of the sort. 
eventually this became the symmetrical model of communication, which I think is probably the second big idea I had. Then my next problem was defining, uh, to choosing a dissertation topic uh, that would be relevant and important. And you have to keep in mind that this was the time of the Vietnam War and I was in graduate school to avoid going there. But yet I thought it was really important to help uh, less fortunate people in the world and a bit as naive as it, it probably sounds, but I thought I, I began working for an organization uh, called the Land Tenure Center at the University of Wisconsin that was funded by the U.S. Agency for, Develop Agency for International Development uh, doing research on agricultural development in, in Latin America and South America. Well, I did public relations work for two years, mostly doing newsletters and editing publications for the Land Tenure Center, but then secured funding for two years of dissertation research in Colombia. So there in Colombia began my interest in international communication and, and different uh, cultures, and, and particularly interest in publics that are less fortunate and that often are ignored or abused by the organizations that work with them. So after two years in, in Colombia, the, the next problem became, how do I find a job? And in those days, one didn't get a job in journalism schools unless you'd been a journalist. And of course, I was only 27 years old, and I was there because I was trying to avoid the Vietnam War. And I had worked summers and so on in public relations, but I hadn't really ever been a journalist. But fortunately, the University of Maryland wanted to start a graduate program, and they were looking for a theorist. And the first question that came up from my department chair, Ray Hebert, was, okay, we need you at the graduate program, but what can you teach at the undergraduate level? Well, I tried out editing. You remember my interest in editing. But I was informed that, no, we had Al Kroll, who had taught this for the last 30 years, and he wasn't interested in sharing it with someone else. So I said, well, how about public relations? So that really began my interest in public relations. Well, the next problem, of course, became what do I teach in public relations? Because there was very little to teach at the time. Uh, well, you do what you know how to do. So I began teaching the situational theory. And that took me about two weeks. And then I had to invent new theories as we went along. And so I learned that theories are developed uh, in, in relationship to problems. And my problem was, what do I fill up 15 weeks with? <laughs> um, the first graduate seminar, seminar, the next year we began a graduate program. And I was assigned a seminar called Corporate Communication. We didn't call it public relations. <clears throat> we had a course in government communication and one in corporate. Now, that gave me the idea that the solution to this problem would be to put the students to work discovering theories, since there wasn't many, there weren't many theories that, that I could teach them. So we took on, I discovered that there was a field of organizational communication. And so what I did was, and there was a uh, bibliography of organizational communication. So each week I assigned students three articles. And they began bringing in synopses, and we began studying them in class. Um, we also did, we're trying to look at how organizations practice public relations. But So we used the situational theory again in that class to identify publics for different client organizations and to be able to perfect that theory. But at the same time, we began to, to look at how organizational theory would be relevant to public relations. Now, that first seminar then introduced me to organizational theory, which is something I'd never studied in graduate school, and especially theories from organizational sociology. Now, in the time I'd been in Colombia, I went there thinking that, like most development communication specialists at the time, that the, the problem in third world countries is that there are these uninformed, ignorant publics who need to be educated and have their attitude changed to become more modern and so on. And after spending two years out on mule trails and in farms throughout Colombia, I came to realize that the problem wasn't the peasants. The problem was the government agencies that uh, couldn't come up with, with solutions or, or programs that were relevant to those publics. 
So that question that came to mind then was, why is this so? Why are organizations so closed from their publics that they don't listen to them or they don't interact with them? So I began then research on uh, why do organizations communicate if they, as they do? And it was essentially the same question of why do publics communicate as they do? And again, problem solving and decision making was the question. Uh, the result of that study was a monograph published in 1966 called Organizations and Public Relations, Testing a Communication Theory. I was very gratified about a month ago to learn that the edit editorial board of journalism monographs, now journalism and mass communication monographs, chose this monograph as one of the most important and most cited works in the history of the publication. Uh, as the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication is celebrating its 100th anniversary. So I, very gratifying, I didn't know, I thank all of you who have cited that publication over the years for its prominence. But that was the first step in extensive research on models of public relations and a search for explanation of why different variables such as organizational structure or culture or environment explain why those models uh, were practiced. Now, although the focus of my research over the years has been on public relations, I've always had a side interest in science writing, which goes back to, to my background in agricultural journalism, which was essentially writing about agricultural research uh, for farmers and others who might use them. Well, that side road has taken me first into the philosophy of science. If I'm going to write about science, I had to understand what it was. And then more recently into cognitive theory, which, under, which helps one to understand the, st the nature of the mind and how the mind works and how to explain complex theories to people. Now, cognitive theory has recently appeared in my thinking about the nature of reputation and I think is very relevant to the concept of reputation. Well, then uh, in the late 1970s, another influence came in my mind when I received a call one day from James Tyrone of the AT&T Corporation, who asked me if I would be interested in participating with him in a study on evaluating or showing the value of public relations to an organization. And AT&T was a regulated uh, company at that time, and constantly the regulators wanted to know why should we spend money on public relations when you're a monopoly? Don't they have, they don't have any choice. So we began a, a program of research. We moved from the question of what is the value of public relations to the program level to say how do we evaluate the, the five programs that AT&T then had in public relations, namely media relations, community relations, employee relations, educational relations, and long distance advertising. Uh, Co-orientational theory became the framework for conceptualizing the effects of public relations and during this time I concentrated on community relations but that work was heavily cited or used in managing public relations. Well all of these, these trends, the situational theory, organizational theory, philosophy of science, evaluation and so on came together in 1984 when the International Association of Business Communicators issued a request for proposals for research on, quote, how, why, and to what extent does communication contribute to the achievement of organizational objectives? Now, this problem statement alerted me to the opportunity to move beyond the program level of evaluation, where we had worked on the AT&T research, to construct a theory of the overall value of the public relations function to the organization. Uh, my colleagues and I who worked on that project, however, also extended the research to include the question of best practices. If public relations is to have value, how should the communication function be organized to provide the greatest value to both the organization and its publics? Now, the excellent study combined a number of middle range theories into a general theory of public relations. It wasn't just the symmetrical model, as many people often assume. But it showed that public relations creates value for organizations through relationships, and that public relations builds relationships more effectively and is most valuable 
when it has several characteristics. It's managerial, strategic, symmetrical, diverse, integrated, socially responsible, ethical, and global. And today, uh, the excellence theory has evolved into a man theory of the strategic management of public relations, which I've contrasted to the symbolic interpretive theory, which I think is an alternative framework for PR and practice. Um, now, the excellence study was international in scope. It included the, the UK and Canada, as well as the United, uh, the United States. But as Dan has already described, the next problem was how do we move this theory into a global theory. When Dan visited Laurie and me in Washington, and I still remember we drank a lot of coffee that afternoon and Dan smoked a lot of cigarettes. We, we've cured him of that problem now. Um, but the question was essentially how should we practice public relations in Slovenia? And that began the work on what we now call the, the global theory of, of generic principles and specific applications that principles of public relations are probably similar around the world but they need to be applied differently in different settings, different cultural, political, economic, so, uh, media settings and so on. Um, well, the excellence study uh, identified the critical role of relationships in explaining the value of public relations and the role of relationships in explaining an organization's reputation and also its performance, its ability to meet different performance indicators. Uh, the relationship uh, theories also suggested that the models of public relations, which live on in many ways, but they could be converted into a number of strategies to use to cultivate relationships. So they're symmetrical strategies, asymmetrical strategies, and so on. So this was really the last big idea, uh, looking at relationships. And I began that, but a number of my former students, uh, most of whom are here today, uh, Christine Wong, Flora Hung, Regina Chen, and uh, Sung Un Yang, have carried on this research with great distinction. Um, so, in retrospect, when I try to understand my intellectual life backwards, as Kierkegaard said, all of this makes sense. Although my life was mostly lived forward by trial and error, and at the time I had no idea where I would end up or whether it would uh, make any sense. Uh, one by one I became intrigued with intellectual and practical problems related to public relations. I engaged in Popper's mental testings to solve the problems. My mentors and my students, and the students were often the mentors, more often than not. Uh, I don't know how many times I've turned ideas over to students and said, find out what you can think about this, or that they've given me ideas that I've, I've gone on to look at. But they suggested problems for me to solve as well as solutions to the problems. Now, today these theoretical solutions seem logically related enough to me that I call them a general theory, when it's based on the preeminence of relationships and various methods, uh, middle range theories for better cultivating relationships. It's not the only general theory, but I think it is a general theory. As I say in a recent article that is being re, uh, republished in the Festschrift book, it's a theoretical eth edifice. It's the structure of a building that has not yet been fully furnished. But I believe it's one that has invited furnishing by others, and it continues to be furnished by colleagues around the world. So thank you very much for letting me try to develop my intellectual history. Thank you.